Welcome to Crazy Nurse RN Hub, where learning becomes a tradition. Come, join me as we explore the multifaceted worlds of nursing. Hi there students! Welcome back to Crazy Nurse RN Hub, where learning becomes a tradition. As continuation to our topics on gas exchange and respiratory function, we have physical assessment of the respiratory system. In your physical assessment of respiratory system, it includes assessing the general appearance of the patient. Also, we assess the upper respiratory structures and the lower respiratory structures as well. We also have here in your assessment, you would notice that your patient might have clubbing of fingers. So it is a change in the normal nail bed and it appears as sponginess of the nail bed and loss of the nail bed angle. And it is found in patients with chronic hypoxic conditions, chronic lung infections, or malignancies of the lungs. So these are the uh, conditions wherein clubbing of fingers might be assessed or noted. We also have cyanosis. It is a bluish coloring of the skin. It is a very late indicator of hypoxia. The presence and absence of cyanosis is determined by the amount of unoxygenated hemoglobin in the blood. So take note that the manifestation of cyanosis is a late sign or late indicator of hypoxia. We also have chest configurations. We have four deformities of the chest. First, barrel chest. Second, funnel chest or your pectus excavatum. Third, is pigeon chest or pectus carinatum. And lastly, we have your kypho scoliosis. First, we have your barrel chest. It occurs as a result of overinflation of the lungs, which increases the antero posterior diameter of the thorax. That means in your barrel chest, there is an expansion of the lungs, okay? So the diameter between your front and your back uh, portion of your thorax are increased. We also have your funnel chest or your pectus excavatum. It occurs when there is a depression in the lower portion of the sternum. So I have here a picture of your funnel chest or your pectus excavatum. So as you can see, there is a depression in the lower portion of the sternum. We also have your pigeon chest or your pectus carinatum. It occurs as a result of the anterior displacement of the sternum, which also increases the anteroposterior diameter. Okay, so I have here a picture of your pigeon breast or chest. So there is an anterior displacement of the sternum. So the anteroposterior diameter is also increased. We also have your kyphoscoliosis. It is characterized by elevation of scapula and a corresponding S shape. Okay? So this is your kyphoscoliosis. Uh, Now let's proceed to the uh, different breathing patterns and respiratory rates. So we have terms such as your eupnea. This is a normal breathing at a rate of 12 to 20 or 14 to 20 breaths per minute. We also have your bradypnea. Slower than normal, so less than 10 breaths per minute with normal depth and rhythm. We also have a term called tachypnea. This is a rapid, shallow breathing, more than 24 breaths per minute. You also have your hypoventilation. 
this is a shallow, irregular breathing. Also, we have your hyperpnea, which means there is an increased depth of respiration. Also, we have your hyperventilation. This is an increased rate and depth of breathing. Also, we have apnea. It is a period of cessation of breathing, chain stalks, it is a regular cycle where, there, where the rate and depth of breathing increase then decrease until apnea, usually around 20 seconds occurs. We also have the Bayot's respiration. It is a period of normal breathing usually three to four breaths, followed by a varying period of apnea, usually 10 to 60 seconds. Lastly, we have your obstructive. It is a prolonged expiratory phase of respiration, and it is associated with airway narrowing and seen in asthma, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, and bronchitis. Now let's proceed to the diagnostic evaluation. So we have here different diagnostic tools or assessment. First is your pulmonary function test or your PFTs. We also have your arterial blood gases or ABGs studies, pulse oximetry, cultures. We also have sputum studies, imaging studies, endoscopic procedures, and we have your biopsy. So these are the following diagnostic tools that we use in assessing our patients in terms of the respiratory system. First, let's have your pulmonary function test. It is performed to assess respiratory function and it determines the extent of this function response to therapy and screening. And it includes measurements of lung volumes, ventilatory function, and mechanisms of breathing, diffusion, and gas exchange. So this is your pulmonary function tests. Now let's proceed to your arterial blood gases studies. It assesses the ability of the lungs to provide adequate oxygen and remove carbon dioxide and the ability of the kidneys to reabsorb and excrete bicarbonate ions to maintain a normal body pH. So I have here a picture on how ABG is taken by a professional nurse or by a medical laboratory practitioner. Okay, so your ABG assesses two things. It assesses the amount of oxygen and carbon dioxide in the body and also it assesses the ability of the kidney to reabsorb and excrete bicarbonate ions okay, in order to maintain the pH level of the body. Now we have your pulse oximetry. It is a non-invasive method of continuously monitoring the oxygen saturation of hemoglobin, satura hemoglobin or your oxygen saturation. It is an effective tool to monitor for subtle or sudden changes in saturation O2. And it is easily used at home and various healthcare settings. So I believe you are all familiar, all familiar with this uh, equipment, your pulse oximeter. Okay? So it is handy. It can be used anywhere in any type of setting and it's very helpful to determine the oxygen saturation of your patient. So the normal oxygen saturation of a normal adult or of a patient should be 95 to 100%. We also have cultures. It helps in identifying pathogens responsible for respiratory infections must be obtained prior to initiation of antibiotics. So it's very important that before starting an antibiotic therapy, 
we must first obtain a culture from the patient. So, in obtaining the culture of patients, we have here examples like we could, uh, we could have throat culture or rapid strep test. And once that sample is taken from the patient, for example, a secretion from the throat, it will then be examined in a laboratory and it will be cultured, okay? So that it will be so that the causative agent such as a bacteria can be identified. And also by identifying that bacteria, it is appropriate to prescribe the it is appropriate to prescribe the right antibiotic medications for that particular bacteria. We also have your sputum studies. It identifies patho uh, pathogenic organisms and also it determines malignant cells. We also have imaging studies such as your x-ray, computed tomography, tomography, sorry, your CT, and magnetic resonance imaging, MRI. And also we have your radio, isotope, or nuclear scans. So first, let's discuss about chest x-ray. It may reveal an extensive pathologic process in the lungs, and it's usually taken after a full inspiration. So the patient actually is uh, instructed to inhale so that the lungs would expand and the pro and the and the lungs would be uh, inflated so that it could be so that the structures would be easily visualized okay so that's the purpose why we need to instruct our patient to inhale fully before the capture of radiograph it consists of two views. First, we have your posterior and anterior projection, that means the front and back of the thorax. Also, we have the lateral projection, that means that's the two sides okay, of the thorax. We also have your computed, computed tomography. It is an imaging method in which the lungs are scanned in successive layers by a narrow beam x-ray. It provides cross-sectional view of the chest. So, it is the same as your x-ray, however, the, the, view that it can, the view that it will capture here is a cross-sectional view, okay? That means it's more detailed as compared to your x-ray. So, the structure of your lungs or your respiratory system can be seen cross-sectionally. Okay, or can have a detailed uh, view for that. We also have your magnetic resonance imaging. So it is similar to a CT scan, except that the magnetic fields and radio fre frequency signals are used instead of radiation. Okay, so it better distinguishes between normal and abnormal tissue when compared to CT scan. So, it is more of a detailed diagnostic image. So, your magnetic resonance imaging would provide you a more detailed diagnostic image of your respiratory system. We also have your fluoroscopic studies. So, we have here fluoroscopy. So, it allows live x-ray images to be generated via a camera to a video screen. And it's used to assist when invasive procedures like chest needle biopsy, transbronchial biopsy. So we could simply say that when we say uh, fluoroscopy, it means that it is x-ray in motion. Okay? So that means you are actually looking for the radiograph of the particular uh, structure in your respiratory system wherein it is moving okay there is a live x-ray images so that's your fluoroscopy fluoroscopy so it's an x-ray in motion we also have your pulmonary angiography it is used to investigate congenital abnormalities of the pulmonary vascular tree and thromboembolic disease of the lungs 
So when we say pulmonary angiography, it focuses on the pulmonary veins or arteries that would uh, examine if there is a problem in terms of the vascular tree, in terms of there is a thromboembolic disease or clots or any plaques that might develop along the pulmonary blood vessels. We also have your radioisotope diagnostic procedures, your lung scans. So we have types of lung scans. First, we have your ventilation and perfusion scan. We also have your gallium scan. And also we have your positron emission tomography or your PET scan. For your ventilation and perfusion lung scan, it is performed by injecting a radioactive agent into a peripheral vein and then obtaining a scan of the chest to detect radiation. For your gallium scan, it is a radioisotope lung scan used to detect inflammation conditions, abscesses, adhesions, and the presence, location, and size of the tumors. And for your positron emission tomography or your tomography or your PET scan, we have uh, it is a radioisotope study with advanced diagnostic capabilities that is used to evaluate lung nodules for malignancy. Next, we have your endoscopic procedures. We have your bronchoscopy, your thoracoscopy, Thoracentesis. For your bronchoscopy, the direct inspection and examination of the larynx, trachea, and bronchi through either a flexible fiber optic bronchoscope or a rigid broncos bronchoscope. So I have here a picture on how bronchoscopy is being done. So the doctor there has a fiber optic bron bronchoscope or a rigid uh, or maybe a rigid bronchoscope then it is being inserted uh, through the nose going to the larynx trachea and to the upper respiratory upper and lower respiratory tract so there is an image okay so in your bronchoscope or in your fiber optic bronchoscope the end of that has a camera okay or and the images will be reflected on the monitor or screen. Okay, that is for the advanced uh, bronchoscopy. However, for some, uh, for a basic bronchoscopy procedure, the doctor uh, would actually visualize the inside of the respiratory system using that bronchoscope okay so it would serve at the at the distal end of your bronchoscope there will be a a part there that the doctor could use that could actually look into the inside of your respiratory system so as shown on the video here the bronchoscope is being inserted then the doctor is looking at the distal end of the bronchoscope in order to visualize the inside of your respiratory tract. We also have your thoracoscopy. It is a diagnostic procedure in which the pleural cavity is examined with an endoscope and fluid and tissue can be obtained for analysis. Okay, so that is your thoracosc uh, thoracoscopy. We also have your thoracentesis, okay? It is an aspiration of fluid in the air from the pleural space. So if you note that there is a fluid or air from the pleural space, so you would suggest or the doctor might perform thoracentesis. So it, it, it is simply the uh, administration or the injection of a needle inside the pleural space and aspirating the fluid or air from that pleural space okay in order for the lungs to fully expand 
and it is performed for diagnostic or therapeutic reasons. Okay, so remember your thorax and thesis is performed in two uh, ways or in two, it has, a two, has two purposes. First is for diagnostic, for example, if you want to examine the fluid inside the pleural space, so thoracentesis can be done in order to collect a sample from that uh, pleural space, okay, the fluid in the pleural space. For therapeutic reasons, however, uh, in order to relieve dyspnea or difficulty of breathing, so the doctor would, uh, would aspirate the fluid or air accumulated inside the pleural space so that the lungs would expand and thus making the person or the patient breathe easily. Next, we have your biopsy. It is the excision of small amount of tissue. We also have your pleural biopsy. It is accomplished by needle biopsy of the pleura thoracoscopy and pleuroscopy and it is performed when there is plural exudate of the undetermined origin or when there is a need to culture or strain the tissue to identify tuberculosis or fungi okay so this is your plural space so it can be done in order to collect uh, specimens to be examined at the laboratory to determine the causative agent of the condition we also have lung biopsy procedures it is performed to obtain tissue for examination when other diagnostic testing indicates potential interstitial lung disease next we have your lymph, lymph node biopsy it is performed to detect spread of pulmonary disease to the lymph node okay so biopsy needle inserted into the lymph node and sample is being removed in order to a, to be examined in the laboratory and it will establish a diagnosis or prognosis okay so this is usually done to know the con to know the condition or the diagnosis of the patient as well as to anticipate and predict the prognosis of the patient as to the severity of the condition. I believe this is the end of our lecture on the assessment and diagnostic tools utilized in examining the respiratory systems.